There are five topics I'm going to cover in this particular presentation. Electric vehicles, active safety, vehicle communications, automated vehicles, and cybersecurity. And they will be covered in that order. Again, this is topics, these are topics that I am less familiar with, but know something about. So, first of all, with regards to electric vehicles, there's just a huge number of standards that exist within SAE and within other places. And this gra detailed graphic attempts to give you a sense of all the possibilities that exist. And this comes or is related to an ANSI document that gives a standardization roadmap for electric vehicles. But there are standards for connectors, there's standards for communication because the connectors need to talk to something. There's standards related to charging to, and uh, so forth. And these, there are just so many of them that it's often difficult for people to keep up on what's happening. Now, one of the things that that activity has caused is for some definition of the standard kinds of connectors. And here we talk about residential connectors, and you can see ones that are common in the United States, other types of connectors that you would find commonly in other parts of the world. And this occurs because the standards were developed at different times. They're designed to handle different levels of power. They're, some are designed for, eight, and the, there are a huge number of reasons why these vary, um, both technically and to be honest, sometimes for political reasons. Likewise, for electric vehicle charging, we have the same situation of many, many different kinds of standards. One which covers some of the issues is SAEJ1772, which is for both electric and hybrid vehicles. And it talks about the connectors themselves, how much power is transmitted, and the communications. Remember that you're not only charging the vehicle, but the vehicle and the charging device need to talk to each other to say, for example, when maybe power should be shut off or some other fa considerations of how power should be provided to the vehicle. Uh, that particular document has 116 pages so that it's quite long. It references 30 other, 34 other standards and there's a, number, a small number of references. And here you just see the kinds of connectors that exist, um, something about who developed them. So for example, the type one is sometimes called the Yazaki standard. Uh, here's a type one, it's so-called CCS because it's combination. Um, and some of the characteristics that they are dealt with are the electrical rating of it, the timing of control signals, um, supply equipment requirements, issues about safety, uh, and other kinds of issues. Um, if you're looking for additional details on these connectors, there's a very nice Wikipedia entry that's referenced here that talks about an IEC document that gets at these types of connectors. SAE uh, J2907, which is an information report, starts to talk about how one describes the performance of powertrains that are electrically driven. Clearly, you'd like to know about the horsepower, the torque, and so forth. Manufacturers want to advertise that. And the question is how you determine that. And so this 24-page document references other standards, doesn't have any other references, which is interesting, and, use a and uses a dynamometer test to determine the performance characteristics of electrified powertrains. And there are two particular kinds of measures. A so-called peak power measure, and one that's much more of a continuous measure. The process for collecting those measurements is described here, and there's other data described down here um, that relates to this particular uh, type of measurement. So this is SAE J2907. And of course, it has, it's not a sort of a standalone document. Why? Because the way you measure electric powertrains has to in some way link to how you do internal combustion engine powertrains. So that refers to J1312 and J1349, which is for internal combustion engines. Uh, 
Another issue is how you transfer power to vehicles, and there's a huge amount of interest in wireless transfer, getting away from plug-ins. Uh, and this is primarily for customer convenience. People don't like to have to take their car, get out of the car, plug in the outlet. Uh, there are just lots of reasons why it's not desirable. They'd like to be able to simply drive into the garage or drive into a parking space, park over or near some kind of device, and for power to be tra transferred wirelessly. So um, this is a rather interesting development which will help push electrification if in fact powering a vehicle or getting power to a vehicle can be made easier. This particular document is of some size, 150 pages long with 50 other standards, and talks about inductive power transfer at four levels, and talks about different ways that one can assess how that, how well, how that trend, that, how the test should be conducted. And so there are issues about safety and health, what kinds of currents and magnetic fields are involved, and are they safe and healthful to people. Um, we're worried about people with implanted medical devices somehow being affected by these systems and having all kinds of physical problems. So there's the transfer performance, there's charging. So obviously people are interested in charging in their own garages, but parking lots is another issue. I mean, People would like to be able simply to park their car at their work. It's charged up and not have to worry about range anxiety, not having enough power to drive to where they want to. Well, if it can be done in a parking lot automatically, it's a rather nice feature. And obviously, there are heavy-duty vehicles, and it has some uh, special considerations. Uh, I want to note that uh, if you're interested in this topic, that uh, there are a number of terms in SAEJ 1715 that pertain to this that somebody should be reading. Uh, next topic is active safety. Uh, one seminal standard in this area is SAEG 3063, which has terms and definitions. Uh, of the topics on which one can write a standard, usually one is most likely to get reasonable acceptance quickly are standards associated with definitions. They tend to be the least controversial. This document is fairly short. It's only seven pages long. It's kind of unusual because it references some URLs. And it talks about different kinds of systems related to active safety. Uh, their description, however, is sometimes tend to be a little more general than you'd like, but at least identifies them and has some use in that way. Here are some other systems that are identified in that particular document. SAEJ 3116 has to do with uh, testing pedestrian mannequins. There's a huge interest in automated vehicles and manually driven vehicles to providing systems that will automatically respond to pedestrians and not strike them. Uh, in the United States, it's more than just a few percent who are killed in motor vehicle crashes are pedestrians. So building systems to uh, avoid crashes with them is rather important and to avoid injuring and killing pedestrians. This is a, a fairly substantial document. It has 46 pages in it and has significant technical detail that's actually very useful for doing tests involving pedestrian mannequins. Uh, this is a picture that shows uh, what the particular situation might be like. And, this, and the tests pertain to both manually driven vehicles, but also automated vehicles that need to detect and respond to pedestrians. So there's all kinds of details in there about how cameras, LIDAR, radar, et cetera, respond. Uh, what does the radar cross-section of a pedestrian look like? Uh, what should be appropriate targets? How big should they be? If they're moving, how should they move? What kinds of clothing should be on them for test purposes? And not just visual representation, but also infrared. Because if you're using an infrared sensor, you need to have a pedestrian or simulated pedestrian that responds in a manner that's somewhat like a real pedestrian. So this contains considerable useful detail and shows that the people that did it spent a lot of time thinking about what the design requirements are. So that's SAEJ 3116.
Oh, I should almost forgot. Here's a, an example of the kind of data that's in that document. So for adults, there are eight dimensions, and uh, there are 15 dimensions for adults that are given, and eight for pedestrians. So if you'd like to have something that responds in a manner like real pedestrians, then you need objects to be detected, namely mannequins that represent pedestrians, that have uh, physical dimensions that are representative of real people. So they're interested in stature. Here's a description of what it is. Here's an adult minimum, and here's the data source. And you can see for all these dimensions, the name of the dimension and the value is provided along with the source. So you can have some confidence that the numbers that are presented are representative of real people. Uh, here's something that you wouldn't find in a typical human factor spec, but is in this particular document, which is the radar cross-section of a person. And interestingly, they do, do both typical adults and obese adults. And here's the 77 gigahertz re return that you get from a real pedestrian. Obviously, the mannequin needs to behave in a manner, in terms of its radar return, that's like a real living person because you just wouldn't want to run these tests with a li real living person with the risk of potentially injuring them. SAEJ3087 is for automatic emergency braking. These systems are becoming very popular on vehicles. They're well received by consumers and they have tremendous benefit in terms of reducing, either mitigating crashes in terms of reducing the impact velocity, or in fact, in many cases, avoiding the crashes entirely. Uh, the focus is primarily on frontal crashes. Uh, this the particular document has about 29 pages, and its real focus, is as, as indicated here, is how do you do the test? And it talks about both crash mitigation and crash warning system and there needs to be some changes in it to be consistent with SAEJ2944, which is yet to occur. Here's the table of contents, or a summary of the table of contents. There isn't one that actually appears that identifies some of the topics that are covered. What kind of instrumentation do you need to do? Uh, you're looking at how a vehicle brakes. Well, you need to do some preparation of the brakes to get a set of conditions that are representative and consistent. So do you take the brakes and just test them cold? No, you need to do some burnishing. What should be the system settings? What kind of tires do you use? How should the vehicle be weighted? How do you uh, record? What data should you record? Uh, how do you process the data? And so on and so forth. And all of these things need to be done in such a manner that you get very consistent results. So that's SAEJ3087, Automatic Emergency Braking uh, Performance Testing. Oh, uh, J3087 has a number of different test conditions that are quite important, namely worried about stop vehicles, slow vehicles, and decelerating vehicles. These are the three things that uh, J3087 is intended to cover. And here are some of the details, the time to collision, the uh, braking uh, conditions that are uh, intended, so on and so forth. Um, so again, considerable detail in this particular document. Uh, the next topic I want to mention is communications. Uh, one example of a document in that category is SAEJ2945, SAE which is concerned with dedicated short-range condition co communications. There's been a lot of discussion about this and other uh, short-range standards and what's going to be available in the future and how. So this is really intended for communication between the vehicle and something else, namely another vehicle or the infrastructure. So for example, should a traffic light be telling the vehicle about when it's going to be changing? If one vehicle is decelerating, instead of sensing that using radar or LIDAR, can one vehicle communicate via wireless method to another vehicle to say what its position is and that it's slowing down or accelerating or maneuvering in some other way. And the rationale behind this is that the sensing devices, in particular LIDAR, are extremely expensive. And so instead of putting a sophisticated set of instruments on a vehicle, can they have something that's lower cost and some communications that allows vehicles to talk to each other 
and maybe crash avoidance technology can be put into practice uh, and out in the world faster and much less expensively. But the big issue is what's the market penetration? And as noted here, the communication only works if everybody agrees on how to communicate. Hence, you need this particular document, J2945. I should comment that it's not one document, but a whole host of documents that apply to different conditions, different systems and subsystems, and different elements of the process. And so they are listed here. Um, I want to talk about just one part of it, which is 2941, which is vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, and give you some examples of some of the issues that are important. So one of the kind of interesting ideas is what's known as automatic electronic brake lights. And the situation we're interested in is as follows. You are in a vehicle like this. There's a vehicle ahead of you and a vehicle ahead of that vehicle that you cannot see. This would be common in a traffic jam situation. That vehicle suddenly brakes, and after some time period, the vehicle ahead of you brakes, and after some time period, you brake. There's a huge advantage to knowing that somebody upstream is braking so that you are forewarned, can get your foot ready to brake, and potentially slow down a bit so that a collision with this vehicle is less likely, and therefore, um, the situation is much safer. So this particular document is quite detailed. It's 127 pages long, has references, nine standards, and has other references as well. And there are a number of other kinds of situations of use cases of communicating between vehicles that 2945-1 covers. Uh, here's an example of some of the details in there in particular of a basic safety message that's actually defined in another document, J2735. And 2735 is rather substantial, 267 um, pages long. Uh, the critical element in 2735 is what's called a basic safety message, which has 50 components to it. And here are some of the things that are communicated from one vehicle to another. And so therefore, if one is collecting driving data, it's important to know what these things are. They'll, they will very likely be available if the vehicle supports 2735. But the notion is if you want to do vehicle analysis or vehicle studies or anything else having to do with vehicles, knowing that it supports 2735 and the kinds of information that might be available from the vehicle, and particularly wirelessly, is actually very useful. Um, there's another aspect of 2735 that's kind of hidden and not getting a lot of attention, but I think I'd like to emphasize, and that is that human factors people should know something about this very technical standard because in the messages, there's a number of details that are communicated from one vehicle to another, from vehicle systems, and so forth. And these really kind of represent what's been identified as the critical attributes relating to a collision situation or a potential collision situation. What this says to people doing human factors work is if you're doing a study that involves a potential collision, the kinds of things that are the elements that are in the vehicle message and the level of detail provided are the kinds of details that you need to provide in reports and documents that you write because these describe in, in what's considered to be accepted detail what happens in a potential crash situation. So it's something that's hidden, but in fact, if you think about it, this is what the vehicle people have accepted. If the human factors people want to be effective in working with them, they need to provide the appropriate detail. Next topic is automated driving systems. One example of a system that relates to that is SAEJ3016. This one is pretty widely used, and it pertains to both definitions and a taxonomy of automated driving systems. Uh, this is a rather unusual standard because it's available for free. It's 30 pages long, and it has, as indicated, a number of definitions in it, some of which are very useful, 
some of which are rather confusing sometimes to the novice. There are a number of terms that I want to bring forward because they're really important. First is the concept called the dynamic driving task, which is the actual driving of what a person does. On real time, in a road, and it relates to actually sort of what we think of as driving the vehicle, operating it, steering, braking, accelerating, and so forth. Uh, responding to objects, you'll hear people talk about object and event detection, maneuvering, and strategic activities like how do I get there? How do I plan my route? In identifying both the dynamic driving task and the operation of various kinds of automation, a critical term that arises is the term of the operational design domain. You'll often see this abbreviated as ODD. It's not cur called ODD, and DDT, or the dry, dy dynamic driving task. And so really, it's where a system can function. So if you have automatic lane keeping, does automatic lane keeping work on all kinds of roads? Does it work on all kinds of weather, all kinds of traffic conditions? What are the constraints under which it operates? Um, here I've given the same idea for auto steer. Under what kinds of roads, conditions, and so forth can this system operate? It's very difficult to communicate that to the user. Uh, there are other terms talking about modes, mode transfer, reliance, and so forth, and they've tried to provide some standard definitions uh, for those terms. It's really useful to try to use their terms and definitions when you can. Probably the most important part of SAE J3016, the most widely cited aspects of it, are the six levels of automation shown on this table. And let me describe those levels, which you may or may not have heard of, and talk about why it matters and how. So level zero is no automation. It's basically the vehicles as they are with nothing in them. Uh, they may be enhanced by active safety systems like automatic braking. These are not considered to be automation because they temporarily take over. So automatic emergency braking breaks for a very various period of time. Um, often you don't have over any control over it. It just does its thing and then shuts off. That's different from driving assistance systems like adaptive cruise control or lane keeping assistance, which are on for an extended period of time and literally take over some aspect of driving. Level two is when both systems are engaged. Level three is those two systems are engaged, but really the vehicle drives, not the driver. But the driver must be able to take over in the event of either the system fails or the vehicle drives to some point where it's beyond the operational design domain of the systems in question. High automation is basically the vehicle drives, and it's either some very limited area or something about it where the driver is really not responsible to take over. That's this fallback cell. And finally, full automation is it just drives everywhere, anywhere, and the person doesn't have to do anything. There's never a steering wheel. There's a the thought there should be no steering wheel in the car, no brake, no accelerator, because essentially it's not needed. Now, these levels are viewed as very distinct, discrete categories. But in reality, it turns out not to be the case. And it turns out not to be the case for the following reason. Suppose a person has a vehicle with adaptive cruise control, so in which case that would be considered a level one system. But let's imagine that over time, that initially adaptive cruise control only works on expressways, and that's it. Now this ACC system is improved, so now it works on other kinds of highways. So in some sense, it's still level one, but it's not identical to the system that was described previously because it has greater functionality. Now let's imagine they do additional work, and that adaptive cruise control system will work on any kind of paved road. All right. So now we have an even more functional system. Now let's imagine we do other things, and it works on any kind of road, paved, unpaved, and so forth. So the difficulty with these levels is that the degree of control often depends upon the design domain of the system and its other functional characteristics, which really affect the level. 
Now, there's no formal scheme that's proposed to define levels more precisely. There's nothing like 1.1 or 1.5 or 2.3, but it is the point to be made is that at sort of a surface level, using this characterization makes sense. But when you talk about the actual implementation, there are lots of subtle differences that come into play. This is important because there have been a lot of discussions about level three and whether level three systems should be implemented because the driver has to take over sometimes and it's not clear whether the driver can do it and under what conditions. The difficulty is there's no real clear threshold sometimes between level two and level three because they'll take a system like this and make small incremental improvements in the operational design domain, the conditions under which a system can operate. And the point at which it transitions from two to three is sometimes not obvious. All right. Uh, some other things that are in J3016 that at some level seem like small points and sometimes don't matter, but other times do. And it has to do with the, the notion of what do we call these things? And J3016 refers to an automated driving system. And the fancy word that it uses deprecates, which means it discourages reference to these terms, self-driving, driverless, unmanned, robotic, or automated. And the document makes some pretty good arguments why those terms shouldn't be used, because they have implications for capabilities of systems that they may not actually have. So for example, a vehicle which is self-driving, well, does that mean that there's no driver present or that simply the driver at some given time is not engaged in driving? And there are other terms in here that, for this, that are listed. And again, there's, there is a lot of concern that because people may misunderstand what the term means, that using it loosely will make inferences about the capabilities of a vehicle which are not properly realized. So it's for that reason that they recommend the use of the term automated driving system. And I'll be honest that sometimes I'm not as careful as I should, should be and will use some of these other terms just because this term, automated driving system, is rather, it's a very technical sounding term and it's not clear that if you use it that people understand what you mean. So although this term is technically correct, if it's not understood by the non-technical people, then maybe there are some issues. All right. In addition, J3114 has this sort of dual quality in that it has an appendix with 200 references in it of papers that are relevant to the topic of automated driving systems. Uh, it's not, it's, it was a useful collection of papers to the committee that created the document. It's the use of this, append, of this appendix with these references, while informative, it's, it's unclear how it's going to be used in the long term. And of course, it needs to be updated quite uh, often because work in this area is progressing at a rapid pace. Uh, J3018 talks about on-road tests for level three to five systems. It's 12 pages long, and I found it to be uh, a little bit on the general side. It talks about some of the capabilities of vehicles. It talks about some personnel and some other items. There are other documents that are coming along to amplify J3018. In part, it's because the field is rather new and some things haven't been defined. Uh, it would be useful to have additional detail, and maybe that will occur in the future. Uh, here's some additional information that um, should be included, some information about test routes, and, but the kinds of roads are just described very generally, categorical. It talks about these are the things you should manipulate. Here's the things about weather, traffic. So in many ways, it, it provides a nice framework but the details that are necessary simply aren't there yet. Uh, again, it may be because we just don't know enough at the current time to provide them, but clearly this is an area where improvements are needed if we're really to be effective in testing uh, automated driving systems. 
The next topic I want to cover is cybersecurity, which is an SAEJ 3061. And literally, this is a guidebook to cybersecurity. It's quite detailed, has a large number of pages, standards, and other references, and talks about a number of items, um, both at a high level, the principles to they're associated with cybersecurity and to avoid cybersecurity problem. Uh, it talks about sort of how you can go beyond it. It refers to a number of key references, in particular ISO 26262, which is the functional safety document that's very widely cited in the uh, automotive literature, both for safety in general and for cybersecurity. It talks about identifying the ASL, the risk level associated with a vehicle, and has lots of kind of details about how cybersecurity evaluations are done. So it's a fairly useful document. Um, here are the guiding principles that I mentioned, knowing your potential, understanding the principles, uh, using, thinking about how the owner uses the vehicle, implementing it and analyzing threats, testing, incident response, uh, and trying to determine what to do when the vehicle owner changes. And the document goes well beyond the description of the principles to talk about how they might be implemented. In particular, the appendix I found to be rather valuable, listing a rather large number of processes that are used to evaluate uh, for cybersecurity. I'm not going to claim to be an expert on any of these or know very much about them. But I can say it was a useful framework. It's intended to be a guidebook. It was. But the guidebook was more than just homilies, but actually had a lot of very useful technical details about how to implement cybersecurity. Again, it's a growing major concern in the auto industry and one that it's really difficult to find the technical people to do the work and who can do it well. Uh, we're going to be at advantage for a long time before it's done right and, and well. Uh, to close, I'd like to, as I've done with all these videos, to thank NIST for supporting the production of these uh, materials. I think this overview will be of interest to, as I've indicated at the beginning, to students at the University of Michigan taking automotive human factors or studying automotive engineering in general. It will be useful to people who are new to automotive engineering to get both an overview of the field and a sense of the latest developments in that area. And so it has lots of general use um, that I think will lead to a large number of people looking at it. So I want to thank NIST for their support of these activities. Again, the video um, will be online, most likely on YouTube. Uh, it will probably be on a site at the University of Michigan possibly at NIST, and the PowerPoints on which this presentation was based will also be available at the University of Michigan. In addition, I'd like to thank Michigan Nexus from the College of Engineering for helping to produce these videos. Uh, it is intended to be a supplement to the Human Factors Engineering short course, which is taught the last week in July and first week in August of each year. For those of you that are interested in information on that course, you can just simply Google the University of Michigan Human Factors Engineering short course or Google the Center for Ergonomics and look for educational opportunities that will be listed there. Thank you for your attention.